Before we get started, uh, no, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, for blessing us and saving us and loving us. And Lord, I ask that you open the eyes and ears and hearts of our understanding so we may each receive a blessing from you today, more of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. amen. Praise God. Uh, tomorrow is Memorial Day, uh, and uh, we're going to be open tomorrow. Regular thing, 5.30 for a meal, uh, 5.30 for a uh, Bible message, 6 o'clock for a meal. If you want to come, come to the 5.30 session first, all right? And we have a meal at 6 o'clock, just like uh, every other day. We'll be open all day, just like normal, okay? Um, it is Memorial Day. So that's uh, what we're really memorializing are our, our soldiers, <clears throat> our army. So I want to ask everybody who is a veteran to stand now please everybody here is a veteran to stand okay two i'm a veteran so i'm standing i have one two three veterans here my fiance is a veteran but he's Who? in the bathroom my oh, fiance yeah All right. thank you very much god bless you god bless you gentlemen yeah. Yeah. you don't count because you didn't stand <laughs> what does that mean, though? Actually, uh, Memorial Day, uh, veterans, uh, oh, you're making a big deal. Well, I got news for you. If it weren't for veterans like those people and myself and others, millions like them, you wouldn't be out here today. That's right. You'd probably all be speaking German right now, yes. right? Or Arabic, one. Right. You just wouldn't be here. Okay, this would be a different, total different country if there weren't. Uh, a part of this population that is willing to sacrifice years of their life to protect this country. Because that's what you do when you go into the military. You swear an allegiance to the flag to protect, regardless of what they do with you, all right? Uh, whether you're in, in combat troops or whether you're in supply troops in, in the kitchen, whatever the case is, you have decided, decided to allow the military to set you in a position that they need you the most and you're defending, defending the country of the United States of America. Um, but the unfortunate thing is, well, uh, in uh, Switzerland, it really works good. Um, we had conscription, I think it was, mid, I think it was 1973, where they had a, a script means the draft, where everybody, all the guys 18 years and older got drafted. Uh, I think in 1973, the Supreme Court uh, canceled that law. <laughs> No more draft, okay? That was a really stupid thing. I'll just mention that to you. Uh, the reason is that that's where, that's why I went into the military. I wasn't drafted. I went in. Okay? And I, I, that's where I grew up. I learned, I learned self-discipline. I learned responsibility. I learned respect for authority. I learned, I learned, I learned. Then I went out to back to, I went back to college after I got out. But the point is, is that the military trained me up, okay? And it should be training everybody up. Now in, in uh, Switzerland, all the guys, actually all the people, I think women too, yeah. I'm not sure, go into the military. Every single one for a period of time, I think it's a, I'm, I'm not sure it's a year, it's two years, two years, okay, two years in the military. Everybody goes in the military. Everybody has a gun. Guess what? Nobody gets robbed. <laughs> Nobody gets murdered. Switzerland is a pretty law-abiding place. How come? Because everybody has a gun. That means law. I mean, you either obey or somebody's going to shoot you. 
like the Old West in, in that sense of the word, okay? So what does the, what does the government of the United States want to do? They want to take away all our guns. What is that going to make us? That's going to make us slaves, literally slaves, okay? And, uh, well, I'm not going to get into all that. So now, with, with that rather interesting opening, I'm, the title of today's message is, <clears throat> regardless of all this garbage that's going on, and all of what's happening in the United States today and in the world, my shepherd loves me. My shepherd loves me. I have a shepherd. Do you have a shepherd? I have a shepherd. His name is Jesus Christ. Ultimately, his name is God. My shepherd loves me. Now let's read this. And what I've done here is I've taken Psalms 23, a favorite psalm of most people, which is only, uh, 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 what, what is it, uh, six verses, seven verses all together. And I have that hall in blackface there, and I have the verses with it so that you'll be able to refer to it when the, the second part is when I start to interpret it. When I start to interpret it, I have the verses as well, but it, because I've got so much stuff to say, I let you refer back up to the original print on top by verse, okay? So <clears throat> let me just read this uh, uh, Psalms uh, 23 to you. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Now that's a, uh, 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 probably the, the favorite psalm of Christians, okay? Because it tells the whole story. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at uh, and interpret it as we go hopefully with the Holy Spirit's leadership and guidance speaking through me, okay? <clears throat> now remember, when I speak, sometimes it's Lionel, and sometimes it's the Holy Spirit. You have to discern which is which, okay? So let's look now at the interpretation of that, okay? Now we start out, now again, I'm gonna start off with reading Psalms 23, 1, which is the, a Psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now we'll go down to the interpretation. A psalm, in the Hebrew, that's a song, a poem. Okay, we set to music, okay? That's the times they had a lute or something to play along with it. Okay, a psalm of David. David's name means loving in the Hebrew. David uh, was, uh, now I have uh, parenthetically here, David was a king, yet he followed God as a sheep. Now you think about that. He was a king, but yet he was a sheep to God. He followed God as a sheep. Now, let's talk about humbleness, okay? He had it all, but he didn't lord it all over everybody. He followed as a sheep. He followed God. All right. So David says this, A psalm of David, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, shepherd, uh, the Lord is my shepherd means, in the Hebrew, shepherd means to tend a flock, to rule, to associate with, Okay, in other words, the Lord associates with him, he rules him as a friend. That's what the, the Hebrew says, as a friend, as a companion. So he's more than just a ruler, telling your rules, our shepherd. He is a friend and a companion. Jesus said himself, said, I call you not servants now, but I call you friends. For the, the servant doesn't know what's really going on, what the friend does. That's, I, that was a loose interpretation, but that's what that was. The Lord is my shepherd. That means to tend a flock, to rule, to associate as a friend, companion. I want you to get an idea of what Jesus Christ is, who Jesus Christ is, who is ultimately God. He is, Jesus Christ is your friend. And it says here, uh, the Amplified Bible has it, to feed, to guide, and shield me. To feed me to guide me and shield me. Shield me, that means, what's shield mean? It means 
like armor, protect me. Okay, he's that kind of a friend. And then it says here, I shall not want. That means I shall not lack. I shall not lack. I'll give you a, a personal reference. When I was uh, uh, in business, uh, uh, after I got a, a university, went and did some things, and I went to, I talked for a while, and I went to business. I had a lot of different businesses. I had a lot of different things that opened and closed, so on and so on. I had a lot of people. I was a, I was a businessman, okay? I was there to make money, and so that's what I did. Um, how I was doing that, I was charging people things and taking taking a, a piece, of, piece of money back, okay? And I thought I had it all, and I did have it all. I had a house, I had a five-bedroom house. I had a, uh, with another house behind it for servants, if, if I wanted it, okay? Uh, all part of the property. I had uh, uh, all kind of businesses. I was a car dealer, motorcycle dealer. I had a nightclub. I had a service station, next to a service station. I had this thing and that thing. I had a, a stores and opened it, all the stuff. I had it all, what the world says to have. I mean, it says, good stuff, wealth and money and power. And you know what? Didn't mount the squat in the end. Didn't mount the squat in the end. All that stuff that I did, all I was doing is I was, <laughs> it wasn't having any fun. I was running around, everybody was trying to get my money, so I, I, had, I had that problem, trying to defend myself, my businesses, so, so on, pay the bills, this, that. It was just not a lot of fun. Okay, so it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I shall not lack. God's gonna take care of me. He does now. I don't have anything. I don't own anything really, a couple, couple old cars, and, uh, uh, but I'm happier I've ever been. Amen. And what's the point of being alive? You want to be miserable or you want to be happy? happy. So I had everything and I was miserable. I mean, I had a good wife, that was the one thing I had, but I was miserable, you know, and I had everything. And now I have nothing and I'm a happy guy, comparatively speaking. Okay, the second verse is this, Psalm uh, 23, 2. I'll read it up on top. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. So let's look at what the interpretation. He maketh me to lie down. That means he, in Hebrew, he makes me to rest. Okay, that means in safety. In safety. Because, as you know, as soon as you leave here, there's all kind of people. If you're going out, <laughs> if you're... I don't care if you live in the woods, you're in danger all the time. If you live in the city, you're in danger most of the time. It doesn't matter. Somebody's always after you for somewhere. Somebody, sooner or later, there's people out there who are going to do something against you. Safety. And there's, we have a whole government that's trying to uh, smother us. I mean, gee, do you feel safe with all the laws and things that they're passing that control you, that make you feel safe? No, I don't think so. Okay, it says, he, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Green means fresh, tender grass, good, healthy food. So the shepherd leads the sheep to good, healthy food. Okay, because the sheep can't find it themselves because they're all kind of barren patches all over. But the good patches, the shepherd knows where the good patches are, and he leads his sheep into the good pastures, the things that are good for them. And pastures, and then and, and what happens at the pasture? You're among other sheep. He, he leads you among other gentle, thoughtful, compassionate, benevolent, kind-hearted sheep. He leads you in a, a, a quiet place of rest with quiet people around you, more like you are around you, of the same kind. Because those people out there are not the same kind of person, whether you know it or not. They think differently than you do. They don't think like you do. If you're saved and born again, you think all the other differently than all those thousands of people all around us who do not, who are not saved and born again, and therefore they do not think the same way you do. It's sort of like sheep and goats. You got them all in the same flock, but the goats think a little differently than the sheep, by sure, all right? But in, if the, the pastures that the Lord leads you will be uh, with, with you in, in, in a flock of like-minded people, Quietly soft, it's like heaven. It's like everything you wanted, it's all love. It's all love, because our shepherd is love. God is love, the Bible says. If he's loved, then what is Jesus Christ, his son? Love, 
God is love. Jesus is love. I shall not, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Leadeth me means, in the Hebrew means, the flows with me. He, my shepherd, Jesus Christ, he protects me. He'll sustain me. I'm talking about, what am I talking about when I say Jesus Christ? Hey, listen, folks. This is my shepherd. Amen. John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among men, and we beheld his glory, his, may we, his glory, uh, as the only begotten of the Son, full of grace and truth. This is my shepherd. That's the metaphor that God gave us in John 1, 14. This is Jesus Christ. Now, what happens when I read this Bible? It guides me. It leads me. It influences me. At the very least, it influences me. Isn't that so? Yes, okay. He's, he's my shepherd. That's what the shepherd does. He guides me. He leads me. He influences me. This is my shepherd, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's your shepherd, too, if you want him. But that's a choice. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Well, what does that mean by the still waters? Still means, in the Hebrew, means peaceful, comfortable, quiet waters. That is, of like thinking humanity. Waters is a symbol of the humanity in the Bible. Of like thinking humanity. So we're all together. God leading us into a, like this, for example, this right now today is an isolated pasture in all that wilderness that's all around us. The wildness. Because all those people on the outside are, are not saved. They're wild. And this is a pretty, I'm saying, we have sheep and goats here too, okay? But let's say the unsaved. But this is a pasture. It's a pasture of green grass. And the green grass is what you're getting to eat right now. Psalm 23, that's green grass. That's good for your soul. That will help you when you get the point of who you are and who he is. That will help you. Psalm uh, 23, verse 3. Let's look up and see what that means. Yea, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Nope, I missed that one. Psalm 23. 3. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Oh, let's go down and look at that now. Psalm 23, verse 3. He restoreth my soul. Wow. Wow. That's an unbelievable statement that is true. He restoreth my soul. Well, what happens uh, when you restore something? Well, I first have to have been whole at one time, and then something happened there, and it needs to be restored back. Well, where are you going to be restored to? If you're going to be restore your soul. What did God create in heaven? God created the heavens and the earth, and he created angels. That's it, which are God's thoughts. God has thought, those are God's thoughts. Angels are God, you're a thought of God. You were created by God. You were his, one of his thoughts. If he had the thought of you first, you wouldn't be here. You didn't just kind of materialize out of the air. You were a thought of God. God created you. You're an angel. Because why do we know that? What does it say here? He's going to restore our soul. He's going to restore our soul. Well, what do, what do you think he's going to restore you back to? Being what you were before, an unsaved heathen? You're going to restore, that's what you were. You were born in sin. You were unsaved heathen, every one of us. Is he going to restore us back to that? Oh, yeah. Think about what the logic, what he's actually saying to you. He's going to restore. The only one place he can restore you in terms of something that is beneficial to him, that is holy, holiness, is as an angel. He restoreth your soul. Now that's why I have it down in red. So you have it down. Now let's read, read what restore means. This is the word of God here. It says, he turns back your soul. He brings back home, or brings back, or brings back home again, 
your soul. He fetches home again. Notice that home? Fetches home again your soul. He causes to return, return your soul. He retrieves your soul. He rescues your soul. That's all in the Hebrew. I'm trying to get the idea across here to us. And I finally, I've been hitting, hammering this thing for four years now, off and on. I'm getting a lot heavier lately, only because we don't have a lot of time left to go. Okay? That we are angels. And he's restoring us. Now, if you don't think that's so, you tell me where you think you're being restored to. <laughs> I mean, where do you think you're being restored to? It's only one place, folks. Yeah. You're being restored home. That's what we say in the vernacular. We say someone died. Oh, he, he was he or she was restored home. Oh, he or she, you say this about someone. Oh, well, what happened to June? Well, she went home. She went home with the Lord. We say that in the vernacular, but we don't get it. We don't understand that it's a restoration process. It, it was different than just going someplace. Uh, like, oh, the, the, what happened to June? She went to, oh, she went, she went to uh, uh, Miami. No, no. She was restored. Restored. Can't go someplace you've never ever been. Okay, he restored my soul. He restores that, turns back, brings back, brings back home again. Home again, causes to return, retreat, rescues my soul. What is your soul? Your soul is your spirit. As we start my soul, my spirit, my collected thoughts. My collected thoughts are my spirit. That's it. And my spirit's going to come out of this body. It's just a temporary place. My spirit is invisible, just like God is invisible. Spirits are invisible. And it's, the only, it's, it's like a miracle. Who ever heard of such a thing? Having invisible things around us. Well, that's your thoughts. That's your spirit. This stuff actually does exist. But it's on a different, how will I say, dimension. It's in a different frame of reference. It exists. That's, I'm coming out of me. Okay, where is it going to go? It's going to go home. It says here, um, he restores me to the who. Oh, well, let me go back. He restores my soul, my spirit, my collected thoughts. And the Amplified has it. He refreshes and restores my life, myself. Okay. The, my commentary is, he restores me into the who I originally was. Isn't that what it really tells us? Yeah. He's going to restore me back into the who I originally was. What was I originally? Well, originally, I was an innocent angel. And then I listened to that dope Satan, and I went down the tubes with him. But I changed my mind. And I went back to God, Father God. Now I'm going back up again. I'm being restored. But you know, I'm being restored to what I was originally. Because God didn't create any evil angels at all. He only created good, good angels. And then later on in uh, Isaiah 45, 7, the Bible says God created this evil. It was after he created all the innocent angels. The innocent angels are God's thoughts. Every single one of them is a thought of God. That's the thoughts of God. Masqueraded as angels, something that's tangible to us that we can envision and see, but nevertheless, it's God's thoughts. That's what your spirit is. Psalm 104.4 says, God made his angels spirits. Well, Hebrews 1.7 says exactly the same thing. God made his angels spirits. You're, and you each have a spirit inside you. And that spirit, if it's being restored, it's being restored into God's heavenly, holy spirit, innocent angel. And if it's not being restored, you're going to stay the way you are and go down the tubes. And of the one third of the Bible says, uh, Revelations, one third of the angels followed Satan down. Now that's countless, millions and millions. Okay. How many do you think are going to be returning? Not that many. Bible says uh, uh, the, uh, the way to heaven is, is wide. Uh, the, the pathway, I'm paraphrasing, the pathway to heaven is actually narrow and straight. Uh, but why does the why does the gate that that leads to destruction? It's easy to go down. 
it's hard to go up because the pathway is narrow and you have to be able to say no to this temptation as you're walking and then this temptation comes along, no to this temptation and then you all go along and these idiots on television who are the leaders, governor of the United States are lying to you and you have to say no, I don't believe that and no, I don't believe that because they lie and then they do exactly what they say that we're supposed to accuse us of doing. It's, it's, it's obvious. Look, they're looking in a mirror when they, when, they, when they talk. And they claim we're doing all these bad things when in fact literally, they're literally doing them. But they don't see it like that. It's strange. They're projecting. It's called projection. They're projecting themselves onto other people. It's very common in psychology. Projection. If you're mean and nasty, you're going to project that to other people and they're going to be mean and you're going to say they're all mean and nasty too. And if you're warm and loving like some people are, not very few, but warm, people are warm, then you're going to project that to other people too and you're going to know, oh, that's a warm and loving person. But they're projecting. We all project our personalities. What kind of a personality do you have? What are you projecting out there to the world? Are you projecting a mean and nasty kind of a person, a grumpy person, a yelling and shouting and screaming all the time, nasty things, negative, 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 negative? Or are you projecting a, a positive personality, a happy, joyful personality, joyful that you're still alive, joyful that God has preserved you, joyful that God has trained you, he selected you to be an angel, a soldier of God in his kingdom. You should be happy about that. You can't say, oh, I'm saved. I, I, I'm saved the board again, but I'm really depressed. Well, what's wrong with you? What are you crazy? What kind of how can you be depressed if you're saved the board again? What's going to happen to you if someone should shoot you in the head right now? Well, I guess I'll go to heaven. Oh, bad. You mean you have to go to heaven? Oh, that's terrible. What can I do? What's wrong with you? You can't. You can't. You can't be depressed and be happy at the same time. It's opposites. And if you're saved and born again, you have absolutely zero reasons to be depressed about anything. That's why, again, I tell you again, when people ask me how I'm doing, I say, great. You notice if I just broke my foot or I got, I got a bad arm and I got this, that, whatever. I'm doing great. How come? Because I'm going to heaven. How can I be doing anything different? I'm going to heaven. So you can beat me up and trade me, cut me off my limbs and do all kinds of, call me names. Hey, baby, I'm going to heaven. I have a staff here of 30 some years now. I would like to ask any members who've been with, some of them within 15, 20 years or so, you ever see me depressed? No. Anybody here ever see me depressed? I get mad, incidentally, because I know you come lying to me, a lot of you lie a lot. You come lying to me about money and so forth. And I get a little mad about that, but I go along with it anyway. But I might get mad, but I don't get depressed. Because why? Because I have the love of God inside me. I have God inside me. I'm walking and talking. God inside me. It's just as a shell. But God's there inside me. The Holy Spirit's inside me. The Spirit of God is inside me. Jesus Christ is inside of me. And I'm walking and talking. I'm carrying them at this point in time. The Bible says that we have a little thing about walking with them. Anyway, uh, he will be, he, what actually is happening is the shepherd is carrying me. The inside is carrying me. But like a sheep. If we had a wandering sheep out there, uh, the shepherd had a wandering sheep, and uh, uh, he, he picked, brought it back with a staff, and then it would wander off again. But sooner or later, he would just break it up, and he'd break a leg. And then he put the sheep around his neck, and he'd carry it back. And that sheep, uh, being carried by the shepherd in that way, would never again depart from the shepherd. Some of you got to be broken to have your legs broken. Some of you are going the wrong direction. You're wandering around doing things that you want to do rather than things that God wants you to do. And who are you supposed to be working for, yourself or God? You got saved for a reason. You didn't get saved for a reason to go sit in a corner someplace and, and uh, draw puzzles. You got saved for a reason for you to go to work. Amen. It's time for you to do something. 
What is it you want you to do? He wants you to save souls and feed his people. That's what we're doing here. We're saving souls and feeding his people. We're doing something. He storeth my soul, restoreth my soul. He leadeth me, that is, guides me in the Hebrew, in paths of righteousness. Paths of righteousness. In the Hebrew, that's the paths of natural right, of moral right, of legal right, in right things. This whole country is based on, the, on these principles here. We're based on Christian principles. That's what our laws are based on. We ignore all that. Oh, no. We're, like like uh, uh, Obama said, we're not a Christian nation anymore. Huh. What do you mean? You got all our laws are Christian laws. I mean, we got, we're follow, like follow, pretty much almost following the Old, Old Testament exactly. And the Ten Commandments. I mean, well, who are you trying to kid? Well, he kidded, he kidded half the population of the United States. They're the same ones who voted for Biden. They don't get it. Let's go to the, the Psalm 23, verse 4. Now you'll like this, uh, the interpretation. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Wow. What is this saying here? Yea, though I walk through the de valley of the shadow of death. That means I have here, though I walk... How often do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Well, I'm walking through it right now. I walk through it every day, every moment of my life, at any time. Bang, something could happen to this, that could happen to this. I could die, go, look at this. You, somebody could shoot me. They're about to do that. <laughs> A lot of things can happen. But what happens when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Because you're walking through it too. We're all in it, baby. Because you can die. You're in a mortal body. Your mortal body can die any second for any number of reasons. Yeah. And you're all in it, whether you're saved or unsaved alike. Everybody here is in that, chat, in that, in that valley of death. Oh! Except the unsaved don't have a chance. They're out of luck. As long as they remain unsaved, they, the valley will get them. It'll closed down upon them. It's like where it's like walk crossing the Red Sea, okay, which is where a valley was created. The waves high on this side, the waves high on this side, waiting to crush the crush the pilgrims crossing the Red Sea. Just waiting to come plax down. And they did the Egyptians who followed. But for the Israelites, they walked across through through this valley of death. That was a valley of death, the Red Sea. Think any second they can just tumble, come back, those big walls, dark walls, huge, you know how much water weighs, hey, huge, maybe 50 foot tall, come, come, could come together and crush you. That's death. Who got through the valley of death? Only the saved Israelites. Oh, is that a clue? I think so. What happened to the Egyptians? those who were chasing him, who weren't saved. Oh, it came together and crushed them. The valley of death. Crossing the Red Sea. Red Sea. Red. Um, <laughs> it's a, it is a, it's actually, uh, by in Hebrew, it's the uh, papyrus. See, papyrus is a, a, a weed that they pressed and made, made uh, paper out of. It's papyrus. Reed, it's a reed seed, technically. Reed, papyrus, papyrus. Well, what do you think this is? Basically, this is papyrus. Well, What do you think this is? This is the Red Sea. And here it is. And we walk through it safely. And others, what this sea will do 
because it's all the rules and regulations, all God's things, it will kill them. If you're unsaved, if you're not born again, you're a dead dude. This is the Red Sea. Goodbye. 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 You're going to die. Because you're actually an Egyptian, not an Israelite. And the Israelites were the not believers. Yea, that I walk through, uh, and it's, I start to uh, Psalm 23 4. Yea, uh, though I uh, walk through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, do I walk from moment to moment. It's with me all the time. I can collapse right here and die. This whole world is a valley of the shadow of death. It's wanting. What does Satan want to do? Who is the God of this world? Yeah, what did, he wants to kill you. That's what Satan wanted to, do, wanted to do to Job, and God wouldn't let him. Satan wanted to kill Job. God, no, can't harm him. Can't do that. He wants to kill you. It's the valley of death. Okay, in the Hebrew, a uh, valley means, uh, in the Hebrew, a gorge from its lofty sides, hence narrow. That's the Red Sea in, in type and shadow. Okay, uh, yea, though I walk through the valley, deep sunless valley of the shadow of death, what does that mean? It's the cold, menacing, ever-present threat. It's walls of eternal darkness on either side about to collapse, about to come down upon whoever's in there. It's the looming danger of total, utter separation from Father God, separation from his open, welcoming arms, the warm embrace of shining light, the all-encompassing, forgiving love of eternal life. That's what it is. It's separation from that. Do you want to be separated from that? Do you want to be separated from Father God? The warm embrace of his shining light. He is the light. Jesus Christ said, I'm the light of the world. The all-encompassing, forgiving love of eternal life. It says here, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Well, what does that mean, fear no evil? What is evil? It's the lurking fear all around us at all times. Lurking meaning this. Hey, everybody here knows it's there. You can die any second. It's lurking. Just waiting to pop up if you do the wrong thing or somebody comes in or something happens, the wrong thing. It's a lurking fear. It's, it's, but what it is, it's the dread, uh, the, the says here, I will fear no evil. Ultimately, it's, it's, the, it's the fear of death. It's the dread of death. The dread of death is dissolved. When I have my shepherd leading me, that's Jesus Christ, my dread of death is dissolved. I don't fear death anymore. I mean, I'm a little apprehensive. All I know is I'm going to go someplace different, that's all. Okay. It's like when all of a sudden I know that I'm going to be transported immediately from here to Disneyland. I'm a little bit apprehensive about that trip, okay, but I don't, I don't have fear of it. We don't fear death. We're just a little apprehensive about the transition. It says here, I will fear no evil, because why? Uh, for thou art with me. Oh, look at that. For, thou art with, for Jesus Christ is with me. For God is with me. And what does that mean here? He says, Thou art with me. Thy rod uh, uh, and staff, they comfort me. Thy rod is, uh, the rod will protect me. The rod was a stick about this long uh, with a knob on the end of it that the shepherd used to, to uh, get rid of wolves and, and uh, uh, to do some hard punishment. Uh, but it, uh, it was, a, it was a, a, a punishing stick more, mostly. And then uh, the... Uh, where am I? Oh, oh, okay. Thy rod will protect me, and thy staff, thy staff will guide me. That was a long crook, long maybe it was uh, seven, eight feet long. It had a had a hook on the end. The sheep gets a little bit out of line, like a lot of my staff does, and you could put the hook around and kind of bring them back in line a little bit. My sheep are my sheep are a little tougher to do. You have to use two hands on the staff with my sheep. Actually, you have to do a lot of really, really, <laughs> because. But 
It's all the same. I will fear no evil. The dread of death is dissolved. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That comfort means they, they gladden me, they secure me, they soothe me, they calm me. Okay. Psalm 23, verse 5 reads up here, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Wow! 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 This is really something. Look what he's saying here. He's doing through every saved born-again Christian. Thou preparest. In the Hebrew, prepares means suddenly he arranges, he puts in order, what? A table. Now, by implication, in the Hebrew, this means a meal for us, okay? And what God is feeding us is revelations, okay? That's what God is feeding us is revelations. He's putting now the picture like a, a, a one of those uh, what's it, what's that uh, Alice in Wonderland or something? Those nice table with all kinds of different foods on it, and so forth and so on, okay? That's the kind of thing. Now, listen, before you get to the table. You learn nothing about those foods. You never ate anything, uh, anything like that. But they were all exotic, different kinds of foods. But when God prepares a table for you, He puts on your table a whole bunch of stuff, a lot of different foods. And when you take one, it's a revelation. Each food is a revelation, and they're all different. Oh, there's one here that looks really good, and all of a sudden you get a revelation from God. And then, whoop, but look, and you take it. So you eat it, you take it. Another, another, there's another, oh, there's something over there that looks really good. I read a few more verses, this, that, so on, and so on, and I, I take it, and I, whoop, it's a revelation from God. Now, what is a revelation? Revel let's look to our footnote on the back, uh, footnote number three. A revelation is, in the dictionary, God's disclosure or manifestation to man of himself and of his will. A revelation is God's disclosure to a man of himself and to his will. And what is this table full of? He says he prepared the table for it. It's full of revelations. It's all for you. It's all for you. Okay. And that's what I've been doing for all these years. I've been picking up different revelations and ingesting them, taking them into me. Taking them into me, taking them into me, taking them into me. I'm full of revelations, and i got a lot more to go. I'm happy about that. That's the best food you can possibly get, because each, each revelation is doing what to me? It's bringing me closer to God. I'm getting closer. And who is God? It's Father God. I'm getting closer to the Father. Every revelation that I get increases me closer and closer to God, to Father God. And what is Father God doing? He's waiting for me with open arms. He's waiting for me with open arms. And he's waiting for you with open arms. Revelation by revelation by revelation, closer and closer and closer you come to God. And it says here now, they'll prepare a state table before me in the presence of my enemies. And that's what's happening now. We have enemies, I have enemies all around us. They're all unsaved people. Every unsaved person is actually my enemy. Some are vocal about it and some are not, but they're all my enemy. All of a sudden. You know, I mean, you, you might want to ask them, why do, you, what do you, why do you not like me? I mean, uh, what, we're, we're doing, not me in particular, but what we do, a Christian uh, teaches, he walks a straight line, he's honest, he's, he's uh, joyful, he's helpful, he's uh, diligent, he, he gives things away, uh, he follows the law. Why would you not like someone like that? And immediately, they hate Christians. Now, why do they hate Christians? Because they're just the opposite. They're not honest, they're not lawful, they're not... They're not, uh, 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 they're just not. And they hate Christians. Automatically, you hate the opposite of yourself. And they hate, there's no other reason for it. The, the, uh, I was a, a teacher for 10 years at, uh, in a, a 4,000 population 
a, a jail we have here in the county. And uh, uh, th that teaching, uh, and they have it all over the country, statistically, uh, I've told you before, the recidivism rate of, of, of uh, j jail inmates uh, who are not saved, not born again, just jail inmates, they, who, recidivism means they come back to jail again. Okay? It's about 80 percent. Now, some places say 70 to 85. Well, let's just take 80 percent. So in other words, out of every 10 jail inmates, eight of those are going to come back again. Okay? Be jailed again because they didn't learn. However, if the jail inmate is a Christian, only 5 percent comes back. 80 percent come back, continue to break the law. Christians, 5 percent continue to break the law. Big difference. So what's, what's happened, this was years ago, uh, even uh, up to 20 years ago or so, uh, they have around the, uh, the, the best program, the best training program possible to get in jail is a Christian program. Mm. Without question, the best possible program. They all know that, as statistically proven, but nobody wants to do it. <laughs> because the, jail, the jailers aren't Christians. Isn't that ironic? When they're turning down the best possible program, statistically proven best possible program, just because they don't like it because they hate these Christians. And these are the, 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 the wardens and the leaders of the, of the jail system. Interesting, interesting, interesting. It's like this rescue mission. What are we here for? We're here to rehabilitate. What happens to those jail people that get the 5%, only 5% return? Well, 95% of them were rehabilitated. They realized they'd broken the law. They decided not to ever do it again, and they went out and they never returned. They were rehabilitated. What happens to this rescue mission right here? What are we doing? We're rehabilitating people. Now, we rehabilitate people who come into us to get a box of groceries or clothing or uh, a, a load of uh, this, that, whatever, furniture and such. We, we're trying to just to help them. That's a witness for Christianity. But our staff is actually being literally rehabilitated. That's what it's, that's what it's doing. That's what we do here. What do you mean rehabilitated? Well, guess what? The Bible says that when you get saved, when you get born again, you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. A new creature thinks differently. A new creature. So that's what we're doing. Most of my staff are saved, born again people. And we're rehabilitating them. We're bringing them out of what they used to be, because they're now new creatures now. We're training them to be new creatures in Christ Jesus. We're training them, training them how to walk with God, how to think like God thinks. That's what he wants you to do. That's the only part that's going to go back to heaven, or a part of that thinks like God. Your godly thoughts are going back to heaven. The rest of you is going down the tubes. So we're in the, we're, uh, Christianity is the best, it's actually the, the best philosophy, it's a philosophy, just like Schopenhauer and Kant and all those other philosophers, it's just a philosophy. Uh, they all have a way of, to life. Every philosophy is a way of life. Well, what do you think Christianity is? It's a way of life. Yep. What do you think religions are? They're ways of life. Yeah. Somebody wants to be a Hindu, somebody wants to be a Buddhist, and they're a Muslim, and they just live those ways. We have selected, I have selected, and you, many, most of you have selected Christianity. Why? Christianity is the only religion that is a religion of love. Love. That's why. Love. What does that mean? That means that the things that I do and the things that I say lead or even influence other people to think become more loving. Loving, loving, loving. That's sacrificial. Sacrificing for other people. Helping other people. Now, if you had it to do, let's say all this stuff is all hogwash. All these religions, including Christianity, is all a bunch of, bunch of hogwash, okay? And so in the end, when you die, that's it. You just disappear. Nothing ever happens. Uh, and you just uh, are gone forever. Well, now if you're a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Muslim, or what, have you, what have you really lost? 
But, oh, I'm going to do it. That's not a way to put it. Let me put it this way. But our religion teaches us to live in a loving fashion, loving manners, loving way to live. So if it winds up to be nothing in the end, like all the rest of them, what have you lost? Man, you've lived a good life. If, if there's nothing comes to this at all, as a Christian, you've lived a good life, you've helped people, you've, you, you, you've loved people, you have you had uh, pity on people, you, had, you, uh, you, you, have, uh, you just have helped lots and lots of people have a happy life. Because that's what happens. When, what happens is you, when you got all the stuff the world says, you wind up being miserable. I had all the stuff the world said to have, and I was miserable. And now I don't have nothing, but I have God, and I'm happy. Do you want to be miserable or do you want to be happy? So if I die and nothing comes of anything, I was a happy guy, man. I've had a good life, period. But I believe all the rest of it's coming to you. It's coming to us because the one thing undeniable, something supernatural is happening. Supernatural. How do I know that? Well, I know that because you and me have an invisible thing inside of us that thinks and acts and talks and does things. And it's invisible. You mean I can't cut you open and see that? No. Man, that's supernatural. That's supernatural. Super, above, means above, beyond the natural. So I know that there's a supernatural thing in existence. Ah, and our Christianity tells us what happens to that supernatural thing when it comes out of this body and where it's going to go. It's supernatural. It really does exist. And it's invisible. Can you believe that? Now, rather than being a Hindu or one of the other ones, rather than being turned into a frog in my, my next life, <laughs> which is what, what I, well, which is, or maybe I'll be a, uh, a, pu a puppy, or maybe a cat, or a, maybe I'll be a worm. Who knows? Uh, some of these really thoughts are just, we got something good going. You know why I know it's good? Because it makes me happy. In spite of all the stuff, it makes me happy. And something that makes you happy is the best thing you can get. That's the best thing you can get. In fact, who do you want to hang around with? Some person, uh, I got this problem, uh, this problem, that problem, this, that, what's going to argue and fight, scrawling all the time. Or do you want to hang around? God, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. All right, happy, yeah. Uh, happy person. How many of you, and you know that because you've done it yourself. How many of you come to see the happy people? You say, man, I like to hang around that person. Because we're so happy. All the time. There aren't that many of them. But when you find one, wow, that's pretty neat. But how many of you want to hang around a miserable person? <laughs> Who wants to do Be a Christian. Be happy. Be happy knowing that the invisible part of you is going back to heaven. And to be with our Lord Jesus Christ and Father God for all eternity. Be happy. It says here, uh, I prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Uh, thou anointest my head. Uh, that's a, a type of the Holy Spirit. Uh, 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 thou anointest my, the, my collected thoughts, my spirit. Uh, you anointest my head with oil. What is the oil? Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. The oil is with revelations through the Holy Spirit leading me, drawing me ever more intimately closer to Father God. That's what a revelation does. And it draws me ever more intimately to God. Yeah, I'm talking intimate now. I'm not talking, hey God, how you doing? Nice seeing you again. Well, I'll see you around. No, I'm talking about, hi, hi, hey God. Oh, man, it's nice to see you. Oh, intimately. Revelation upon revelation upon revelation is building each of us up to be more and more and more intimate with Father God. Don't you want to be? Now I know a lot of us have had bad. I had my I had a stepfather who used to beat me a lot, 
Uh, I, I, I understand that. But he was a nice guy. I mean, he was great to my mom and the kids. He just he didn't like me a lot. <laughs> but he, he got saved. He got born again when I was 16. Man, he changed. He stopped beating me. I, I thought that was pretty cool. I don't care what I, hey, all right, man. <laughs> uh, I lost my thought there. Okay. Okay, the revelations. Now here's 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 what the Bible says now. The revelations the revelations are a cup, a cup of revelations. Each of us has a cup of revelations. That's something that God gives us. He gives, he fills up our cup with revelations, okay? My my head uh, now not just my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The cup of my and that's my cup. I have a cup of revelations and God's really running it over. That's what I'm doing up here. That's why I'm up here and you're not. Because my cup is running over and I'm giving out revelations to you that I'm getting because that's it. my cup is running over. It's rimming, it's rimming full. That's what God does. He fills me up with revelations and then I come and I spill over onto you folks all sitting around me. And you know what? Each of you sitting around me is sitting around and in your hand and you can't see it is an open cup for revelations. And each of you is receiving revelations as you listen to the message. Because they're spilling over onto you. Now, lots of, lots of those revelations are coming on you and kind of missing you, or they, they run off and don't, don't quite hit your cup because you're not really paying, you know. But if you're holding your cup right, you're getting those revelations. They're filling your cup. They're filling your cup, I know. And those, whose revelations are they? After you, if they fill your cup. They're your revelations. That's, uh, the word of God comes both vertically and horizontally. Uh, uh, Isaiah talks about the word of God coming down. Coming down from, from God vertically, horizontally, person to person, same person to same person. Transfers, okay? Your cups are being filled with revelation upon revelation upon revelation. And one day your cup will run over too. Hopefully, that's the great thing when your cup starts running over. That's the real blessings. I mean, when you got, like, I'm really blessed. I got to tell you this. God's uh, just popping me up with so much stuff. Uh, it's just a, a wonderful thing. I'm a, I don't, <laughs> and I'm not being pompous or being, I'm a special. I'm just a regular guy. I'm just a regular human being who started to read the Bible and just started and God, why? Here's why God is using me and started to use me. Because I was willing. I was willing to be used as an instrument of God. I'm an instrument of God. And this means it's something that you use. He's using me to talk to you folks, okay? He uses all, all kinds of people to talk. He, we're instruments of God. And I'm a willing instrument. And I'm really a willing instrument. There are many things I would say, in fact, there are many things I'd say no to that he wants me to do. I'm a willing instrument of God. And God wants you to be a willing instrument of God, too. The more willing you are, the more you're going to get the more revelation you're going to get. But you've got to be willing. Because you've got what willing to what? Willing to change. Ooh, oh, that's the hard part now. Willing to change. Yes, because nobody wants to change. Regardless of your situation, nobody wants to change. Because of what you're all a product of what you've learned, what you've come, the accumulation of everything that you know. You're a product of that, and you don't want to change it. Because you're comfortable with it. You can use it, you're happy with it. But God says, no, there's more to it. You need to add me to it, and then change it, and become an instrument of God. To become an instrument of God. Work for God. That's what the vision is all about, working for God. Okay, he anointeth my head with oil, that is with revelations with the Holy Spirit, uh, leading me, drawing me ever more intimately closer to God. My cup 
that is my depth, my width, my height, and my comprehension, my level of understanding, does what? It runneth over. My cup runneth over. He's given me so much. That is my, uh, runneth over in the Hebrew means my satisfaction. That's my wealth. And I have here a commentary. Overflows toward other people around me, spilling onto and filling their cups of blessings as you're holding it out. Now, if you don't hold out your cup of blessing, you don't get no blessings. Now, there are people who stand outside or they come here just to eat and that's, that's all. There's lots of people who are willing, any some of my staff are not willing to hold a cup of blessings and receive blessings. Nope, I don't want to. Because blessings mean change. Nope, not me. I'm like me the way I am. I'm going to, yeah, well, it's up to you. I don't, I, I like me the way I am, but if you can show me one area biblically where I'm wrong and it has to be in the Bible, Man, I will change, I, like uh, Jack, I mean, uh, Powell, just Powell, just like that. Because I need to be corrected. I need to be correct every time. So if you can show me one error that's in the Bible that you can substantiate in the Bible, I will change. That's what I learned. How about you? Well, how many of you are still fighting all these the simple things like, oh, you're not angels, really? Yeah, we're not. Wait, that's all a bunch of garbage. We're not angels. Well, there's all kind of proof in the Bible that you're angels. You just got to open your eyes. I mean, I've, I've seen it over and over and over and over and over. Open your eyes. Uh, it even says right here, he restoreth your, my soul. Well, he restores. Restores means put back like it originally was. Well, was that godly? I don't think so. You were born in sin. The only time you were ever godly is when you are Every any only time conceivably that you're going to possibly become, become godly is if you were a you are a fallen a fallen angel, and you were innocent at one time. And he, God is going to try. He's not try. He's restoring you back to what you were. He's giving it to you back again. He's taking you back from Satan, because we followed Satan down here. Now we don't have a memory of that because we don't have any holiness anymore. God took away our holiness. When we fell, if that doesn't ring a bell, and and, and, and again, uh, my favorite one, Ecclesiastes 12:7, says we're going to the spirit shall return to God who gave it, and then I can go into the book of Revelations and in chapter 19 we see the uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the John, the gospel writer John, talking to an angel, and the angel says, uh, "I'm your servant, and so on and so on." Uh, I'm God. Which is confirmed in, in, in I think it's chapter 21. Same thing happens. John's talking to another angel. And the other angel says, Well, I'm just like you. I'm a guy that's like you. Can't, don't worship me. I'm a guy that's like you. The guys are angels. When I saw those two things, started thinking about them, that got me started about the angels. So I started to go backwards and look and so and so on. It all proves out. If you don't get it, don't totally disregard it. Warning that. Just think about it. That's all. Just think about it. Okay, he says here this. Now my cup runneth over. Overflows toward other people around me, spilling onto it, filling their cups of blessings. Verse 26, 23, verse 6. Have a seat. It says this. This is the last verse. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, let's look at that verse. It says, surely goodness and mercy. Man, that sounds pretty neat, doesn't it? Shall follow me. What does that mean? Follow me is, well, behind me. What's behind me? Well, my footsteps are behind me, aren't they? My footsteps, every time I step someplace, it makes an impact. Even on cement, it makes a minute, minuscule impact, but it makes an impact. Every time I take a step, it makes an impact. Goodness and mercy shall follow me. If my steps are righteous steps, goodness and mercy shall follow me. Okay, well, let's look at this now a minute now. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. What are they? They're like two loving sheepdogs. See, the shepherds had dogs. They also walked with dogs. The dogs went around. They were guard dogs, guard dogs for the sheep because the dogs were warred off all the wolves and that. So the shepherds had guards, and they still do. They have dogs. 
that they're trained that they will also manage the sheep. And so these two these two things are like are like a, a metaphor, if you like. Goodness and mercy shall follow me. These two guard dogs are following me, every place I go, and they do what I say, every place. Okay, they're loving. They love me. Don't you love? Don't you remember? Have you ever been in love with a dog? I have many times. I love dogs. They catch you because they don't love you back. They just use you. But the dogs dogs love you back. All right. So these two, uh, these sheep dogs, are like two loving dogs, who are my intimate companions. They're my friends. My dog was my friend. I know people who, uh, uh, um, most people, they make such an attachment to their their dog that when it dies, it's like a person. It's a friend. These these two two loving sheep dogs that are my companions, serving together with me. The beloved sheep, and that's what we're doing today. Serving together with me, the beloved sheep, and that's you. And don't get me wrong that I'm not a sheep because I am too. In the hierarchy, I'm a sheep as well. And that's what King David, remember? King David, uh, his name was Loving now in the Hebrew. David was a king, yet he followed God as a sheep. He followed, essentially, Jesus Christ. And it says here now in Psalm 23, 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I will dwell, means in Hebrew, means abide in the house of the Lord. What is the house of the Lord? It's a wonderful place sheepfold in heaven. That's what it really is. If Jesus Christ is a shepherd and his people all sheep, heaven is a sheepfold. It's a wonderful place in heaven. For how long? Forever. That's what God has in store for you. If you're willing to believe. Love, if you're willing to accept it. Accept it. Jesus is waiting with open arms, right on the cross, open arms. He's waiting for you to be restored back to where you came from, to what you really are, the supernatural, invisible spirit that's inside you. John 3, 3 said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Right, so I'm going to ask here, well, Jesus is the guy. Uh, uh, Jesus said, except the man be born again. So he didn't say, except the man be black or white or pink or polka dotted or purple or brown or gray or Baptist or Protestant or Catholic or Muslim or uh, this and that. Word. He said, except the man be born again. Only way. Well, how does one get to be born again? John, or excuse me, uh, Romans 10 9 explains it that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that means say words out loud. Confess means that you realize you've broken God's laws. You've sinned. You're a sinner. You've broken God's laws. You're asking for, for forgiveness. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's born again. Saved. So I ask now, <clears throat> is there anyone here today who's never said that prayer? would like to say it for the first time. Please raise your hand, and we'll say it with you. I will say it first, and you can say it after me. Anybody at all here today want to say it? We have an internet congregation. We don't know how many people are watching. Right now, it goes out to every country in the world. It will continue to do so 24-7 after they, maybe after Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday when it's posted, or maybe sooner, uh, 
uh, to all the world. In other words, if the Lord tarries five years from now, that'll still be active out there 24 hours a day. And people can say this prayer with us and they can get saved 24 hours a day. So, I'm going to say this prayer now. And, and uh, you're all angels from my point of view. Uh, and hopefully you finally realize that now. If you'd all please stand and say the prayer with me, I would certainly appreciate that. Uh, we, can't, uh, we can't get people saved, but we can escort them to the door in a heavenly fashion. All right. So let's all say this now. New people in the internet congregation can raise your, uh, can you stand up? And if you don't want to stand up, you know, well, I shouldn't say that. You can just say this prayer after me. Let's say it together, shall we? Father God. I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for all my sins and was resurrected. Thank you, Lord. Father God, please send your sign, your seed, your love into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you, Father God. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to take uh, we're going to take tithes and offerings. Yeah. And I'll remind you again. We're open tomorrow. We'll have a nice dinner tomorrow night, uh, as usual, for those who care to come. And as we take the tithes and offerings, why are we doing that? Because we're trying to give you another blessing. Every person here, let me understand, unless you understand, every person here has a cup. Now, some of you are here and you're not saved. So you didn't open your cup today, you kind of kept it to yourself. Your cup will not receive any blessings unless you're saved. So you can forget that. Okay? But those of you who did, what God has done is he's, he's got these, uh, uh, these tithes and offerings is a, a, a type of a way to, to bless you more. He said, uh, if, you, if you obey him and you tithe, he'll open the windows of heaven above you so that you cannot contain the blessings. The, notice he said, so that you cannot contain the blessings that will flow down upon you. Why don't we just uh, talk about run, your cup runneth over, right? If you're saved and tithe, your cup will runneth over with the blessings that God will pour down upon you. And if you choose not to tithe, doesn't mean you can't go to heaven, okay? Uh, just mean, just, why don't you just wait outside? For Bless God. Bless God. Thank you, Lord. God bless God. You know, I said that for a while years ago. I, uh, I started saying, God bless God. I thought, I'd never heard anybody say that before. God bless God. Woo. And I, I started thinking about that. And it's where I still kept saying it, though. A couple years, a couple years. And now I've come across in the Bible, I think it's twice now where I've seen different people saying, God bless God. Think about this. What's the ultimate thing you could do for Father God? Well, what's the ultimate thing he does for you? He blesses you, right? Well, guess what? Remember the, the angels, in Jacob's letter, the, the angels came, were ascending and descending with blessings. The, they, they were as, uh, descending from God with blessings. And then on the ladder, they're going back up with their ascending with blessings from you to God. Well, what is that when you say, God bless God? That's a blessing to God. I mean, God is all powerful, all, all knowing, whatever. But that's saying, uh, we're asking the eminent, all powerful, all, all powerful to bless himself. It's, it's a blessing to God. It's the ultimate blessing you could give to God. I would think in, that, in those terms, uh, if, uh, something to bless. If it makes any sense at all, I don't know if it does or not to you, but to me it makes sense. And it's in the Bible, no less, on top of it. And so I don't have to be worried about saying anymore. Because it was kind of tricky, like, how can, I, how can God bless God? Well, God can do anything. Nothing is impossible with God, right? That's what the Bible says. 
Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful message today. Thank you, Lord, that you continue to bless us with more of you. I ask that every person here that you open their eyes and ears and hearts of their understanding excuse me, so they can receive more of you this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. amen. All right, God bless you all. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Food. The food. Bless the food. Come out. Oh. This is William. Yes, that's you. Come on out of here. And since you stood up, you can do it. He's also the cook, one of the cooks, anyway. Him, him, oh, go ahead. Um, thank you for providing our food for the service and the people eat after the service. And thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us the opportunity to prepare the food and uh, have a nice day. And thank God. Thank you. God bless you. All right. Talk time. See you tomorrow. We have, a, we have a group coming in of singers coming in tomorrow for the message. Yes. To what? I don't know. You talk to me later.